Greetings, salutations. Welcome to this Midday Power Surge, Thursday, August 11th, 2022. This is your spiritual oasis on this pilgrim journey. Safe to Serve International, first-time viewers, welcome one, welcome all to this Midday Power Surge. Well, as you can see, my friends, it's August 11th. And there is a prophetic significance for that date. How many of you recall the prophetic significance of the date August 11th? All right. I'm going to touch on that for a few moments at the beginning of this presentation. Then I'm going to insert several current events to complement the date August 11th. All right. And then at the back end of the presentation, I'm going to return to that biblical prophetic date august 11th we are going to be addressing the movement that somewhat seems to be nullifying the biblical prophetic word what movement is this there is a movement on foot that is repealing sunder laws repealing sunder laws and many individuals see these news reports and say here, there are the evidences that confirm there will never be a national Sunday law with persecution for God's commandment keeping people, seventh day Sabbath keeping people. Here's my point later on. What you're going to see, the very signs that are showing Sunday laws are being repealed or the actual signs to confirm the national Sunday law will be enforced. How is that so, Pastor? Will you stay tuned prayerfully? Let's get right into it. Let's begin. We're told now, friends, we must spend time studying the seven trumpets, the seven biblical trumpets. And the Bible shows us the seven trumpets in the book of Revelation chapter 8. The seven trumpets are divided into two groups two groups the first four are simply called trumpets the last three are called woe 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 the last three trumpets are connected to woes in other words the fifth trumpet first woe the sixth trumpet second woe the seventh trumpet is connected to the third woe that's revelation chapter 8 and revelation 9 I'm not going to spend time to dig into this right now. Let's focus now on the sixth trumpet in connection with the second woe. All right. This woe portion addresses the power of Islam. All right. Muslims in the Bible. That is Revelation 9, verse number 12 to verse number 21. I'm going to encourage you to read the book, The Great Controversy, Page number 334. That's what I'm going to touch on for the few next few moments. In the year 1840, another remarkable fulfillment of prophecy excited widespread interest. Two years before Josiah Litch, one of the leading ministers preaching the second advent, published an exposition of Revelation 9, predicting predicting the fall of the Ottoman Empire. According to his calculations, this power was to be overthrown in the year A.D. 1840, sometime in the month of August. And only a few days previous to its accomplishment, he wrote, he was so confident prayerfully and providentially, allowing the first period, that's the fifth trumpet, the first woe, 150 years to have been exactly fulfilled before Diocosis ascended the throne by permission of the Turks, you know, Turkey, Turks, and that the 391 years, 15 days, the sixth trumpet, second woe commence at the close of the first period. It will end on what date, everybody? August 11th, 1840, when the Ottoman power in Constantinople 
may be expected to be broken. And this, I believe, will be found to be the case. In other words, brothers and sisters, this prophecy was fulfilled by a current event. Yet many people are telling you, don't focus on current event events. Those people are ignorant. They want to keep you in darkness. This fulfillment of Revelation 9, six trumpet, second woe, it points to the fact the Bible does teach, the Bible does confirm a day for a year principle. One prophetic day represents one literal year. That's what was confirmed. One day points to a year. Next paragraph, it goes on to say, at the very time specified, Turkey, through her ambassadors, accepted the protection of the allied powers of Europe and thus placed herself under the control of Christian nations. The event exactly fulfilled the prediction. Pause right there, friends. What other prophecy in the Bible gives us a day for a year principle? Beloved, Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14, the 2,300 days. It represents 2,300 years, this prophecy. Confirmed it, friends. Are we together? So Seventh-day Adventists have not followed cunningly devised fables. They believe the truth as God leaves. What truth specifically? That the 2,300 prophetic days, 2,300 years, which began in 457 B.C. and came to an end October 22nd, 1844. It's not fable. No. That Christ began his ministry in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Yes. And he's about to close that work. All right. Let's finish up here, friends. When it became known, multitudes were convinced of the correctness of the principles of prophetic, prophetic interpretation adopted by William Miller and his associates. And a wonderful impetus was given to the Advent movement. Pause right there. What other prophecy shows us day for a year principle? Time, times, dividing of time, 1260 days, 1260 years, 538 AD to 1798, the fall, the deadly wound received by the papacy. That's it. Several more, 42 months. All right, notice as we close now, men of learning and position united with William Miller, both in preaching and publishing his views. And from what year to what year? From 1840, August 11th. From August 11th, 1840 to October 22nd, 1844, the work rapidly extended. All right. Let's now come to present day. We are removed from August 11th, 1840. October 22nd, 1844, 1840 through 1844. What about today? Look at the same book, friends. And the point I'm going to confirm is this. It was a current event that fulfilled the prophecy. It was a date prophecy. In these last days, there's no more time prophecy. Events based on dates. No. We look for now. Events to fulfill the prophecy, not dates. Events, not dates. Look at this now. All right. Great Controversy, page 611. The angel who unites in the proclamation of the third angel's message is to lighten the whole earth with his glory. That's Revelation chapter 18, verse 1 through verse 4. We have come now. To August 11th, 2022. Second sentence. A work of worldwide extent and unwanted power is here foretold. Look at the contrast here now. 
the juxtaposition, the Advent movement of 1840 to 1844, the Advent movement of August 11, 1840 to October 22nd, 1844, was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. The first angel's message was carried to every, every missionary station in the world. And in some countries, there was the greatest religious interest which has been witnessed in any land since the reformation of the 16th century. But, watch now, but these are to be exceeded. What's the these? The movement from 1840 to 1844 and the reformation of the 16th century. Yes, you mean the movement under John Wycliffe? John Huss, yes, Martin Luther, Zwingli, you mean that movement, yes, William Miller, yes, the Advent movement, yes, but these are to be exceeded by the mighty movement under the last warning of the third angel, yes, brothers and sisters, so now, let's not speculate anything here, so what are we now to be doing? We need to be moving forward in the work of aggressive, effective evangelism. Beginning in our homes and then around the world, wherever you are, be the light wherever you are. The prophetic significance of August 11th. How many professed? How many professed preachers are going to act as if August 11th is not significant? And even on their social media sites, website, yes, how many will speak about August 11th as a memorial, 1840, August 11th, 2022. Let me move on here. Let's take a look now at what we should be looking for in order to have a more impetus, a more aggressive movement now than the reformation of the 16th century, than the movement between 1840 and 1844. It says, first sentence, page 605, it's current events, friends. Listen, heretofore, those who presented the truths of the third angel's message have often been regarded as mere alarmists. What is she talking about here, friends? Let's back. This is paragraph 3 of page 605. Look at paragraph 2 of page 605. What is the essence of the paragraph? A coming Sunday law. That's it right there. The final test, Sabbath or Sunday. The final test, the seal of God, the seventh day Sabbath or the mark of the beast. Sunday worship by law with persecution for dissenters. Then come back now, paragraph 3. Their predictions that religious intolerance would gain control in the United States. That church and state would unite. Don't forget that phrase. That church and state would unite to persecute those who keep the commandments of God have been pronounced groundless and absurd. It has been confidently declared that this land could never become other than what it has been, the defender of religious freedom. But, hmm, as the question of enforcing Sunday observance, there it is, is widely agitated, the event so long doubted and disbelieved is seen to be approaching. Not when it comes. No, 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 no. It is seen to be approaching. And the third message will produce an effect which it could not have had before, brothers and sisters. All right. The stage is set now. The prophetic significance of August 11th in connection with the third angel's message and the fourth angel's message, the loud cry, my friends. Are we now seeing the approaching call, the approaching National Sunday Law? Yes, if we're seeing it now, what am I waiting on? Safe to Surf International, first time viewers, professed Seventh day Adventists, what are you waiting on? It's time to be praying for 
power, conversion, the glory of God to go forward in aggressive, effective evangelism. Don't just talk about evangelism, but do evangelism and make sure simultaneously you are converted. Now, current events. What I'm going to share with you is two parts. Two parts. First part, a movement repealing Sunday laws. The pendulum of prophecy, current events, it's swinging to the far left and then it's going to swing to the far right, brothers and sisters, to the far right. Oh, brothers and sisters, are we together now? And the very, again, again, yes, I'm a scratched record, yes. And again, the very movement calling for repealing Sunday laws, many say, Based on those reports, there'll never be a Sunday law. I'm going to prove the mere fact you have a movement calling for repealing Sunday laws. Open up stores on Sunday. Buy and sell on Sunday. All right. It is evidence. Yes. A Sunday law is coming. Watch. There it is, friends. Fresh off the press, August 9th. New bill. To extend Sunday trading hours. Where is this happening? In the land down under. Move on. For a Sunday. I have no, not much time. Let me give you a few clips here, friends. Watch carefully. Time for a Sunday trip to the shops. I mean, definitely need to that. I opened earlier to help Adelaide, for sure. We often find ourselves sitting and waiting to buy groceries uh, in a lot full of people. And so at 11 a.m., there's a massive rush to go buy groceries. The state government moving forward with its push to allow retailers to trade from 9 a.m. on Sundays. This is a policy that we took to the election. It's a policy that isn't just supported by workers, but it's also supported by business. It'd be great for us. I mean, we're about to employ more money goes into the economy. We employ more people and they're going to get more hours. But advocates warn it could come at a cost for smaller mum and dad operators. They'll never get that trade back. That turnover will be lost forever. They will eventually uh, be forced to make changes in their store and probably that'll come with staff. Generally, Sunday's a nice day of day to uh, rest. Yeah, so maybe 11 o'clock sounds like a good time. Boxing Day trading will also be cemented. Shops can open from 9 to 5, no matter what day the holiday falls on. But it seems a shopping spree on other public holidays, for now, is off the cards. Our view is that we get the balance right. We can extend hours on Sundays, but public holidays by and large, should be preserved as an opportunity for friends and family to get together. There are now calls for the opposition to support the legislation. Mm, mm, mm. But All right, we get the point. No, friends, I'm going to simply go through a slew, yes, a series of these events. Watch carefully, friends. Man blasts Sunday shop hours as outdated joke. You wait until the Sunday law comes. Who will laugh last? You watch. But others argue why they must stay. All right. There it is. But not everyone is happy about the requirement set out in the Sunday Trading Act in 1994. Let's move on here, friends. Anger as shopper brands supermarket Sunday trading hours outdated. It's a joke. Mean. Yes. No longer in the land down under. We have come now to the Americas, North America, the United States. Maine hunters sue to eliminate ban on Sunday hunting. Protest against Sunday fishing ban planned at Naples Pier. Uh, pier. That's it, friends. It's here. It's swinging to the far left. Iowa senator. Sunday ban on car and motorhome sales is a little archaic. You wait until the Sunday law comes. You will see what you think was archaic is actually modern. You watch. There it is. Let's swing back to, the, to Europe. Thousands of mot motorbikers protest, protest, propose Sunday ban. Watch this, friends. Listen, this is going to be right here. A nail in a sure place. Again. Watch. What they think is a sign is not coming. Watch carefully. It is the evidence is coming. Walmart 
spearheads push for Sunday alcohol sales. In other words, buying liquor on Sundays. Wait a minute. What should that remind you of? Minnesota governor signs law allowing Sunday liquor sales. Here it is, friends. Church historian A.T. Jones writes, Listen, the platform of the California State Prohibition Party. Prohibition? We favor the enactment of a law requiring one day in seven as a day of rest. What day were they talking about? Sunday as a civil institution, but providing that where any individual habitually rests from labor upon a certain day of the week, such persons shall not be required to rest upon any other day, but providing further that in no case, in no case, shall intoxicating liquors be sold upon such rest days. That's it, friends. Remember, the Sunday Blue Laws in America, one of its reasons for its existence, its enactment, is to ban the sale of liquor on Sunday. That's it, friends. Mm -hmm. So now as we're seeing the movement, come on now. There it is, friends. There it is. Walmart now spearheading push for Sunday alcohol sales. And the senator, the governor, we know what time it is. Now they're going to call back for a return of the Sunday laws. For what purpose? To bring back morality. That's it. There it is, friends. Clear as crystal. The nail in the sure place. Great controversy. Page 587. Sunday law to bring back what? Morality. We are here, brothers and sisters. It will be declared that men are offending God by the violation of that Sunday Sabbath. That's what we are told. So once the pendulum swings left, far left, what will come after? It's going to swing far right. It will be declared that men are offending God by the violation of the Sunday Sabbath. This sin has brought calamities. We need Sunday worship. Bottom paragraph, they will lament the great wickedness in the world. And second, the testimony of religious teachers that the degraded state of morals is caused by the desecration of Sunday. Great will be the indignation excited against all who refuse to accept their testimony. And brothers and sisters, Notice what has happened recently to push for now. Sunday laws, Sunday laws, Sunday rest. Now in this segment, you will see the pendulum swinging to the right. That pendulum in the clock, tick, tock, tick, tock. The pendulum in the wall clock. The, yes, the old grandfather clock, tick, tock. Talk. Watch carefully, my friends. Residents raise concerns with Linfield FC over Sunday games at Windsor Park, August 8th, my friends. There it is. I want to read one paragraph here. It says, this Sunday, August 14th, Linfield will play that other side. All right. The first time in the history of either club that they will have played football on a Sunday. That Two traditionally Protestant clubs should breach the fourth commandment. Mm, 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 mm. In this way, highlights the continued erosion of the moral and spiritual fabric of society in Ulster. This is, however, what happens when individuals and nations depart from the word of God. So individuals and nations must return to God. In doing what? Resting on Sunday by law. Look at the headline. Breakers of Sabbath will answer to God. August 10th, my friends. And today's August 11th. They will answer to God. Is not that what we were told? In Great Controversy, page 590, we are here. Another one. Another one. Ferry. Breakdowns as a rebuke from God. Why? They are breaking God's Sunday Sabbath, said these church leaders. 
That's it, friends. And what? They will receive the punishment of God, blue words. That's it, friends. It's swinging to the right, just as we were told. In Great Controversy, page 579. That's it, friends. That's it. Rest on Sunday. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. There it is. So while many individuals are seeing these events repealing Sunday laws, work on Sunday, shop on Sunday, buy and sell. You know what we're told in the book, Great Controversy? Page 527, they're looking for hooks to hang their doubts upon. And 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3 through verse 5, the Bible says, In the last day shall come scoffers. The signs are clear, and yet they're asking, Where are the signs of Sunday law is coming? Where are the signs? Christ is soon to return. There it is. For this they willingly are ignorant. And God in his mercy and pity is holding back the winds of strife. The son the law. Why? He wills that none of us perish. But that we all come to a repentance. That's it. Move on. Sabbath breaking, cause tsunami, it's coming brothers and sisters, wrath of God, blame for high number of Calmac ferry cancellations, and that goes back to what? The economy going belly up, that's it, a financial crisis, why? They are breaking God's Sabbath, which they call Sunday, wrong day my friends, listen now, FedEx, yes FedEx, to suspend Sunday deliveries. It's coming, brothers and sisters. I'm telling you it's coming. Iceland is calling for closing stores on Sundays. Cutting the hours. It's swinging. I want to give you a few clips here. Listen. Iceland shoppers demand law change as supermarket makes major announcement. Listen. While many praised Iceland for that decision most people saw it as an opportunity to demand the law change to allow supermarkets to close on sunday close on sunday law that's it quote when i was growing up no supermarkets open on a sunday sunday should be family day and a day of rest just as the pope said sunday for families it's here my friends listen don't open on a Sunday. End off. Yes, we used to manage, and I'm sure we would manage again. Give staff a day off, a day of rest. Good. Should not shop on Sundays. You have six days to shop. Rest on the seventh. Amen. Poor souls, my friends. No, no notice. We are told as we see the call for Sunday, rest approaching. We are told the third angel's message will receive a power it could not have had before. So what are we to look at? What? So we can see the sun, the law is approaching. What? The walls? In the home? What? Hmm? What? The Bible and the media. The Bible and current events. Again, I'm going to say it. Don't listen to preachers who tell you, don't focus on current events. Let me add, some of them won't say it publicly, but listen to their sermons and their Bible studies. Their sermons and Bible studies are void of current events fulfilling prophecy. Void. That means if they were living in the time of August 11th, 1840 to October 22nd, 1844, they would not have been a part of the movement of the Advent believers, the great Advent movement with William Miller, Joshua V. Himes, Josiah Litch, and the, they would not have been in that group. They would not have been a part of the reformer, the, the Reformation, the Reformers, Reformation of the 16th century. Yes. As it is approaching, it's time, my friend. It's time. All right, let's read some more. Listen, good, close on Sunday. That's what they're saying, my friends. Now watch the climate change rhetoric. Red words, well, it's a start. 
would like to see a leader in the move towards Sunday clothes, relieve workers, shoppers, and the carbon footprint. That's it. The carbon footprint close all shops on Sunday. Should all be closed on Sunday. That's it, my friends. That's it. That's it. Sunday law. Let me give you some more. I'm not finished with you yet. Listen. All right. Renewing a sense of the Sabbath. Listen, come to America now. We can choose to live a life that seeks a rhythm of work and rest, of effort and recovery. We can choose to observe Sabbath during my childhood. Reminiscing, friends. Reminiscing. Reminiscing. In Connecticut, a form of enforced Sabbath, a form of enforced Sabbath was actually state law since colonial days, nicknamed Blue Laws. These laws still limited what could be bought and sold on Sunday, buy and sell, buy and sell. That's Revelation 13. Come on, friends. Verse 15 to verse 17, as we see the call for the Sunday law, a Sunday law approaching, right? You, could re you can read the rest of that, friends. If you want to end climate change, rest on Sunday. If you want to end viruses, pandemic of pestilences, rest on Sunday. You want to end wars? And political dysfunction, you need a Sunday law. A Sunday law. It might be Sunday worship in community. It's there, friends. It's there. Listen. And now, throughout our history, reminiscing on the sun, a call again for Sunday laws. Look at the dates. It's all there. Look at the dates. A few days ago, throughout our history, we have established. Laws that appear to violate this amendment, such as the blue laws. Listen in the middle. Many states have these laws on the books, banning certain activities on Sundays. But wait. Listen. These are people in the world deducing the fact this call for a return to Sunday rest by law, Sunday worship by law, it would violate our freedoms. They can see it coming. <laughs> Lord have mercy upon SDAs. But SDAs, the majority of them, are blind, incredulous, yes, apathetic. Watch carefully. It says, but wait, what if your rest period is from Friday? evening to Saturday evenings like in Judaism and we're and Seventh Day Adventists oh you thought we were not known huh listen it seems to me that any law that we put in place would contradict would violate freedoms brothers and sisters that's it like with blue laws, if the federal government defers to the states, then the fundamental right, the fundamental right ceases to exist. The world can Now, why would the author put that in print? If he didn't see something brewing in the pot, something boiling and bubbling in the pot. If he did not see an ominous crisis on the horizon that's why he penned these words volume 5 page 546 it says oh my friends our people have been too insignificant to be worthy of notice but a change will come a change will come yes when we compare the population of professed SDAs with the other churches in America. We are a small number, but a change will come. You can read the rest of that quote. And friends, it says uh, the Sunday movement is now on foot. Laws are going to come to do what? To compel the conscience. Direct quote, to compel the conscience. As we see it approaching, get ready. 
aggressive evangelism, the spirit of August 11th, 1840 to October 22nd, 1844. Now, the author penned the words of uh, Congresswoman Bobbert. I won't read the words. I'm going to play the video he was referencing. The reason we had so many overreaching regulations in our nation is because the church complied. The church is supposed to direct the government. The government is not supposed to direct the church. That is not how our founding fathers intended it. And I'm and I'm tired of this separation of church and state junk that's not in the Constitution. It was in a stinking letter, and it means nothing like what they say it does. He says, now, when I first heard this, it sent a chill down my spine. I couldn't even believe it. To me, it was the constitutional equivalent of someone standing up and saying it was time to ban all guns. Surprisingly, there was almost no backlash. None, brothers and sisters. Mm -mm. While most blue laws are relatively harmless, the concept, the concept behind them that a particular religion can enact laws requiring our entire society to comply with their particular beliefs is simply unconstitutional. Furthermore, it threatens our most fundamental precept. If a law is worth the ink it is written with, if a law is worth the paper it is written on. If a law is worth the computer page it is typed on, it must have penalty, punishment for violators. They can see it, brothers and sisters. They can see it. At this junction, I'm going to segue from that now. The point has been made. If the point has been made, those of you who are alive, type in the word, a nail Finishing nails in a sure place. Now, I'm going to close upon the point. I began with the biblical, prophetic significance of August 11th, of course, 1840. Look with me now at Revelation. Remember, we began in chapter 9 of Revelation. Verse 12 through verse 21, which shows us the sixth trumpet. And the second woe. Well, the Bible mentions the second and third woes in Revelation chapter 11. Look with me at verse number 14. Second woe is past, August 11th, 1840. The third woe cometh quickly. Note this. The third woe is connected to the seventh trumpet. Those of you who are alive, talk to me. How many trumpets are in the book of Revelation? I gave it to you earlier. Seven trumpets. What does the number seven represent in prophecy? It represents the end, finality, completion. The seventh trumpet, third woe, brings the end. Let's read this now and see where we must focus. As we see a thunder law coming in verse number, in verse number 15, the seventh trumpet signals the second coming of Christ. That's what it signals. Verse 18 signals the crises on the earth. I won't focus on that right now. I just covered the crises. The nations are angry and thy wrath is come. That's verse 18. What is God's wrath? The seven last plagues and the second death. That's Revelation 14. Yes, verse number 9, verse 10, chapter 15, verse 1, chapter 16, verse 1, all the way through. And what brings the wrath of God? Talk to me, my friends. It's the mark of the beast. So notice three steps. Nations are angry. Then comes what? A son the law to appease their anger. Then comes what? The wrath of God. Three steps. Three strikes are out. But that's not where 
the seventh trumpet ends. That's not where we must focus on only. Not only current events. Look at verse 19 now. Oh, brothers and sisters. Can I preface this? Can I preface this? I won't. Let's read verse 19. And the temple of God was open in heaven. In heaven. Temple of God open. And there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And there were, yes, my friends, lightnings, thunderings, voices, earthquake, great hail, bringing us back to Mount Sinai in Exodus 19, Exodus 20. What signs were shown at Mount Sinai? Mount Sinai was on smoke, hail, that's fire. Hail is linked to fire in the Bible. Mount Sinai on smoke. Was there a trumpet voice? Yes, at Mount Sinai, when God spake the Ten Commandments. Mount Sinai, earthquake. The earth quaked, the Bible says. Mount Sinai, when God spoke, there was a thunder. Thunder rolled. Yes. So notice now, what temple in heaven was opened? Final trumpet, third woe. What temple was opened? The part of the temple that had the ark of God's testament, the Ten Commandments. Yes. What apartment was that? What apartment is that? Talk to me, those of you who are alive. It is the most holy place. The most holy place. Remember, let me give it to you now, the preface I was going to share. So now watch. The second woe. Sixth trumpet. August 11th, 1840 through October 22nd, 1844 was a movement based on prophecy, based on current events, and also based on Jesus moving from the holy place to the most holy place, period. So now, since God grouped all three woes, first, second, third, that means the third woe must also have, watch carefully, prophecy, current events, and pointing the people to whom? To where? You got it, friends. To whom? To where? Christ's work. We're in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Great controversy. Page 488. Those who would share the benefits of the Savior's mediation should permit nothing to interfere with their duty to perfect what, everybody? To perfect holiness. Holiness in the fear of God. The precious hours, instead of being given to pleasure, to display, or to gain seeking, should be devoted to an earnest, prayerful study of the word of truth. The subject of the sanctuary and the investigative judgment should be clearly understood by the people of God. How many? Next sentence. How many? All need a knowledge for themselves of the position and the work of their great high priest. Yes. Otherwise, it will be impossible for them to exercise the faith to exercise the faith which is essential at this time. What shall we need, friends? Faith. Faith, my friends. Number two, evangelism. Or to occupy the position God designs for them to feel. Where must we focus? Upon whom? Upon Christ. So again, before you go to bed tonight, read that chapter in the book Great Controversy, an American reformer from the book Great Controversy. Yes, sir. And focus on page number 334. And page 333. It's all there, friends. Please take a look at that. And now, the singers, gospel vocal brothers, will sing to the Lord the song, Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Christ will give you power to perfect holiness. 
He will give you the resources to find yourself in the country. Food on your property. He will give you the wisdom. Yes, the resources. Yes, the human assistance to establish a, a, a vital, essential ministry, industry. Yes, he will also put in your heart the spirit of love, assisting others, and to eradicate the twin demons of selfishness and covetousness. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. What are you going through? Sickness, tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. What are you going through? A financial strain, tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. You have no other choice. What will you do? Murmur? Complain? Tis so sweet to trust. And those who trust in him and surrender all, he has never failed. He will never fail. Trust. Pastor, what must I do? Trust. Yes. Trust. Tis so sweet. Send in your prayer requests. Thank you for joining us for Midday Power Search. We'll be singing a hymn titled, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. We hope you're blessed. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take Him at His word. Just to rest upon His promise. Just to know saith the Lord Jesus Jesus how I trust him how I've proved him more and more Jesus Jesus precious Jesus oh for grace to trust him more yes it is sweet to trust in Jesus just from sin and self to cease, just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, pray. Jesus. 